Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us for tonight's panel from the Alumni Career Pathways series. This one is on visual art, and I'm very excited to have our panelists here tonight. My name is Sara, and I'm from Alumni Relations. I'd like to acknowledge that we are having this panel on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. And let's get started. So first, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Right to my right is Kirk Gower, who is a visual artist based in Vancouver, Canada. In his practice, Kirk explores queer identity through oil painting. Kirk graduated in 2010 with a Bachelor of Fine Arts from ECU. Kirk's work has been featured in Visionary Magazine, Sad Magazine, The Globe and Mail, Daily Hive, and Vancouver Sun, among others. Recent exhibitions include the Seymour Art Gallery, New and Emerging, Caraton Art Gallery, Figures in Motion, and the Vancouver Mural Festival. In the center, we have April Delanoche Milne, who is an illustrator and writer based in Vancouver. April graduated in 2014 with a BFA in illustration from ECU and completed the Writer's Studio program at SFU in 2022. She is the artist for the graphic novel, The Blue Road, A Fable of Migration, and the children's book, The Imperfect Garden. April's work has been featured in The Globe and Mail, Chatelaine, Briar Patch Magazine, Event Mag, and Teaching Tolerance, among others. April is one of the contributors to the comics anthology, The Witching Hours, and one of the contributing artists to Chromatic 10 Meditations on Crisis in Art and Letters. And on the far left, we have Carl Mata Hippel, is a Filipino-Canadian multidisciplinary artist and curator creating on the unceded traditional territories of the Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh Nations, aka North Vancouver. Currently, his artistic practice looks at archival collections from galleries and museums to investigate the absence or presence of Filipinos in Canada. He aims to weave his story and disturb Filipino invisibility within the Canadian landscape. He holds a BFA from 2022 with a major in visual arts and a minor in curatorial practices from ECU. He has curated an exhibition at the Gordon Smith Gallery and FKA Faculty Gallery in ECU. His gallery exhibitions include the Burnaby Village Museum, the Garage, Burrard Arts Foundation, Center A, Headline Gallery, Seymour Art Gallery, the Reach Gallery Museum, and Federation Gallery. He was also the artist in residence awardee at the Herschel Supply Company in Gastown. Very excited to have all our panelists here, and I will allow Kirk to introduce his practice further. Thank you, Sara. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Kirk Gower, and I'm a visual artist, predominantly painting figuratively, and my art practice focuses around queer identity in contemporary portraiture and images. Often my artwork and painting start off as sumptuous, sort of smoothly rendered images, and at that point I then disrupt them with uh, the actual oil paint that I use to create them with thick gobs of paint. Sometimes the, the paint itself can be quite comical in nature. It can be quite direct. It can be confrontational. It can be grotesque and especially queer. Um, often I will use myself as the subject or people in my life, uh, whether that be my partner or other individuals that sort of inspire me. You'll see a lot of the same people in my work uh, just because I feel most connected with them. And there's sort of a, a connection for me when painting them. Um, my work often interacts with the viewer. Um, that's something that I'm always uh, quite interested in is how to connect with the viewer uh, and how does the work interact with them. So you'll see that the, the thick paint on top often is a way to sort of, you know, push the viewer out of the image and make themselves very aware of how they're feeling. Also, the, the image images under the, the thick paint often will, you know, pull the viewer in, seduce them in a way, and then also, you know, push them back out, whether that be with, you know, eyes peering out of shadows, looking directly back at you, um, whether that be, you know, gestures pointing at you or interacting with you. Um, those are the things that I really do find interesting is that paint has the ability to both seduce and repulse the viewer. And I'm constantly sort of working, you know, that fine line between the two. That's briefly, you know, some of the things that I'm thinking about. Thank you so much, Kirk. 
Next, we have April. Um, <clears throat> through illustration and comics, my work explores grief, memories, the humor of everyday narratives and issues of identity. My process often begins with my poetry, handwritten diaries, digital records, videos, photos, and Google Keep Notes. Working from this personal source material, I map out stories in frames and drawings and often finish my professional work using digital drawing tools like Procreate. I feel naturally inclined to line work and detail in my illustrations, practicing both the visual and emotional act of observing and filtering my observations through a sense of humor, because I think nothing lightens a heavy load like making somebody laugh. Thank you, April. And lastly, we have Carl. Okay, yeah, my name is Carl Hupel and I'm a Filipino um, Canadian multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary artist and curator creating on the um, traditional unceded territories of the Squamish and Slay with this nations, also known as um, North Vancouver. Um, my work um, spans from drawing, painting, photography, sculpture, um, weaving and art installation. Um, and as you have, um, Sarah mentioned earlier, um, my current practice looks at um, archival collections, especially um, particularly photographs from galleries and museums to investigate um, the Filipino invis invisibility. Um, in my earlier um, art education, I mainly focused in painting, which I called abstract blueprint paintings, um, and that expanded um, towards my um, last term in fourth year with um, sculptures, public artwork, um, art installation. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, Carl. We're going to jump into the questions. We'll start with Kirk and move our way through for each question. What are some recent highlights in your creative practice? What moments stick out to you as artistic milestones? So in the last year, I've had uh, a lot of really great moments. Um, I guess the one that sort of sticks out the most is probably the Vancouver Mural Festival. Um, I was lucky enough to participate in last year's festival in, and in the heat, it was a very interesting experience. Um, also the public aspect of it, I found sort of invigorating. Typically my practice is quite isolating and singular and it's, you know, my time, it's not often shared with others. So it was an interesting experience having people stop by, talk to me about the work, talk to me about their work and their lives. And, and I ended up meeting a lot of people. So that was definitely a highlight last year. And then another one that's sort of continuing on this year that's sort of exciting me is the curated editions uh, with the Printmaker Studio um, and curated, curated tastes. Um, it's been such a nice way to connect with the community. Um, each month they've uh, had someone join this edition where they create prints that can be sort of purchased. Um, and then at the end of the year, will come together in a group exhibition and the prints, the master prints will be available. Um, so that's happening, I guess, in May, which I'm quite excited about. Um, and then, you know, milestones, you know, throughout my sort of art practice, there's been, you know, small ones that I consider milestones and then larger ones that maybe would be more considered, you know, milestones generally. But I think just continuing a creative practice is really, uh, my biggest sort of milestone is like, it takes dedication, it takes practice and I'll continue to do it. So yeah, those are some of the highlights. Thank you, Kirk. April? Um, recent highlights. Last year I did a residency in France, a two week residency, and that was really beautiful. And I really enjoyed it. It was my first time doing a residency. I'd never considered it before that for some reason. Um, and also I got an agent last year, so that was really exciting for me. Um, in terms of milestones, I think, I mean, illustrating my first book was very exciting. And also I did a couple murals with my friend Don Lowe, and those were both really, they're both in Richmond. And I think those were milestones because it was just so much work. Um, I'm trying to think of, yeah, I mean, when we did our first like when we pitched the Blue Road to Arsenal Pulp Press, that was, and giving the go ahead to do that, that was that was very much a milestone. Also on the boring side, uh, figuring out an invoice template, <laughs> it 
was very exciting, administratively speaking. <laughs> Thanks, April. Carl? Yeah, in my case, it would be um, the same last year. I did so much stuff last year, like so much first things. Um, I did my first art installation through the Garage for Art Arts Foundation, and that's like one of my most ambitious projects. One that I've thought um, during my third year, um, I also uh, I also did another commission um, for the Bernabe Village Museum, which was um, shown earlier. It's like the arch where it's my, like that's my first time working with digital um, collage or drawing. Um, they mostly did like the printing and assembly, but that's also my another one of my public art um, um, project. Another one is um, a project that I did for Herschel as well, where I did a weaving um, that is expanding from my 2D um, weaving, which was my graduation project. Um, um, yeah, all of those those th four things, my graduation project and those three commissions were happening at the same time. So it was um, um, a lot of time and balancing act to do, um, managing like assignments at school and those um, commission projects. Um, I also did the Vancouver Mural Fest with another artist. Um, it's my first collaborative mural um, and another photography project with the unit paid um, organization. Perfect, thank you so much, everyone. What challenges are you currently facing as a creative and what are you currently excited about? My biggest challenge right now is time. <laughs> uh, uh, my artistic practice is constantly in battle with my my corporate career, so I'm quite busy. Um, so time seems to be the biggest uh, obstacle that I face is when there's not enough time to actually do everything I want to. So there's been opportunities that have come my way and I have to be real, really realistic with uh, what I can actually take on and and do at the caliber that I want to. Um, and then I guess it kind of, it goes the other way. The thing that I'm excited about uh, sort of this year is spending more time in the studio. There was a lot of opportunities last year that took me out of it. And so I didn't create as much work as I wanted to. And so I've, you know, purposely turned down some opportunities this year so I could build a new body of work and really spend that time back in the studio. It's hard saying no to things, but sometimes it's worthwhile, especially when you're putting it back into your your work and what you're creating. Thank you so much, Kirk. April? Yeah, I have, I have the same challenge. I feel like keeping my time organized because I also work full time. So just like weeknights and weekend mornings are like making sure that it's balanced but it's hard because you need to like put yourself into it um I think another challenge for me is sometimes just comparing myself to other artists and being like oh they're here I should also be exactly there but everyone has a different journey um so I don't know I think that that's something that I've been like considering especially with Instagram and like Twitter and like looking at like where are my views? Where are my followers? Like, I don't know. I think that's a challenge, <laughs> to be honest. But something I'm excited about is I'm working on a children's book pitch with my agent. So it'll be the first one that I've written. So I'm really excited about that. Um, yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that project, April? Um, it's, well, it's not like, <laughs> I can say that it's about a little girl who has sensory issues and enjoys the nighttime over the daytime. So yeah, that's all that I can really talk about, but it will be called Nora at night. So that's yeah. great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Carl. Yeah. I also wrote down time and balancing um, your time. Um, especially if uh, you have so much, like if I have so much projects going on and also I, versus ideas that I wanted to um, make. Um, yeah. So, so what helped me um, kind of put what helped me in this in that process is to like really put things down into paper and to prioritize things. Um, another upcoming project where I had to kind of compare um, the idea or like, I mean, pair up my idea versus the proposal call is my upcoming exhibition this end of the month, which is for the Kukutlam Heritage. Um, and the proposal is about um, a response to their database collection. So it's um, responding um, to their collection. So, and I've been wanting to create um, a project that um, connects or tells the story of Filipino. And so for this one, I kind of tied up together, create, responding to the collection of the, uh, the organization, but also doing my idea or something that I wanted to push myself, myself into, which is weaving photography and also um, working with more archival photographs. And so that's upcoming. 
And another one that I'm looking forward to is my project with my brother. It's a curation that I did. Um, my brother Kim Hippel right behind over there. So it's a curation that I did um, with our stuff, Photography Works, which is featured at the, the Capture Photo Fest this April. Thank you so much. So this next one's a little complicated. There's a three-part question for you. What is your definition of success as an artist? And how would you dispel the myths around timelines for that success? And how did you transition from school into your independent practice? Well, that's a fun one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so my definition of success, uh, I, you know, I struggle with that one because there's obviously, you know, sometimes I compare myself to other artists and what they're doing and that inherently plays into, you know, myself and what I'm not doing. And I, I can't help but think that I'm not necessarily as successful because I'm not getting the same opportunities or I'm not doing as much. Um, but I think of recently, I guess my measurement of success is like enjoyment. How much am I enjoying my art practice? How, many, how much am I enjoying the opportunities that are coming my way? Um, so that would be my sort of internal sort of definition of success. Um, and then how would I dispel any myths around timelines for success as an artist? Well, I've been graduated for almost 15 years now, and I can tell you where I am today is probably the most, you know, successful I've been on paper. Um, so it takes some time. Uh, and, you know, don't, don't be discouraged. Uh, you, you know, opportunities will come and sometimes there's not very many within a calendar year, but that's okay as well. Um, because eventually they do come and with every sort of, you know, rejection, there's, uh, there's also an opportunity on the other end. Um, so don't be so hard on yourself. Uh, and it, it does take time. You also have to be able to do the work. So you can't, you know, have a small body of work and expect all the success to come your way. Uh, I learned that early on in my career was I kept calling myself an artist, but I wasn't creating any art. So that was a really like game changer for me. I was like, oh, I guess I have to like actually create the work to get the success. So I would say in the last eight years, that's what I've been doing. Um, oh, this is a long question. <laughs> what, what's the next one? What's the... Uh, Oh, it was transition. So yeah, Emily Carr was intense for me. I was also really young. I was like 17 when I started and I graduated when I was like 21. So <laughs> I didn't really know who I was, what I was doing, what I wanted to say. I also don't think I had enough life experience to say anything, even though I thought at the time I did. Um, so I left Emily Carr and I took a break from my art practice for about two years. And then eventually I got back to it after I've had more life experience and things to talk about and uh, maybe a perspective that was uniquely my own. Um, so the transition was, you know, it was evolving and I think it continues to evolve and I continue to sort of go with the flow to a certain certain deg degree. Thanks, Kirk. April? Yeah, um, I think success as an artist, I agree. I feel like... I feel like this was something that I've struggled with too, but I think it's having an active practice that you find an, that you enjoy, that you find fulfilling, um, which is maybe sometimes different from financial security. <laughs> but like, why are you in it? I don't know. I I think that it took a while for me to also understand what having a practice meant. I feel like I was in school. I also, I was like 20 and just trying to get homework done and going to my part-time job and like struggling to get to class on time. And I didn't know what it meant to have a practice. I, I struggled with that for years until I looked back and I was like, oh, I've been showing up over and over again. That's what having a practice is. I've been drawing on a regular basis, like which ebbs and flows. And sometimes that's hours a day. And sometimes that's like, I don't know, 10 minutes doodling every other day. But I do think that's my practice is just like the act of returning and like consistency. Um, yeah, the transition, I think, from school to practice was a bit of a struggle, but it was just about consistency. Um, yeah. Thanks, April. Carl? Yeah, so um, yeah, for me, this is one of the toughest questions. Um, it, it can be very vague, but also definitive depending on like the perspective you're looking at. Um, 
Um, for example, if I would look at it, my parents' perspective, it would be financial stability. So once graduating, you need to work and make a living. But for me, I would define success as um, at my early stage of career right now um, as an emerging artist, as being able to continuously um, learning, sharing, and growing. Um, my practice is like very personal that personal in a way that it is like talking about like how I belong to this land and um, my relationship to this land and being a kind of also like through the investigations being um, like learning things and, and learning things. Um, uh, yeah, and then I guess that's the beauty of also being an artist, a creative, like we can define our own successes. Like this is my definition, you can define your own right now. Um, and yeah, timeline, we can set our own timelines. Um, one great practice or tip that I was, that I have heard during my third year was um, setting your own ambitious and like wildest dreams in like timelines, setting it in like two years, five years or 10 years. Um, and I don't remember like creating timelines for my fifth and 10 years, but I know for sure in my second year, um, in two year time, I know I wanted to create ambitious projects. And I was able to do that in as quick as a, an, a year. Um, I was making works while I I'm still in school. Um, um, started submitting things when I was like in my second year. Um, that was when I kind of thought, oh, my school's not teaching me how to get out there and how to propose things. Um, write artist statement biographies. And so um, during my second year, I started writing my own artist statement, statements biography and like thinking through what I wanted my career would look like um, based off like um, the artists that I follow and um, artists of my interests. Um, I kind of looked through their um, biography CVs, some um, interviews and resumes and tried to follow what they were doing. And so I started um, submit, submitting to exhibitions, applying to calls um, as early as my third, first, first some third year of um, I've been exhibiting outside of school, making projects out of outside of school, and I'm using my time in school um, to really create a concrete body of work, something that I a work that I know, um, so that once I go out into these galleries, I know what I'm talking about. Uh, it might not be very like wide in range, but it's like very concrete in something in one thing that I know that I um, I can be pr proud of. Perfect. Thank you so much, Carl. So I'm going to divvy this question up just a little bit. So first, do you have a job or career outside your art practice, and is it related or independent from your practice? It's definitely independent. <laughs> uh, by day, I'm a, a conversion manager for a large insurance company, and I have about 50 people who directly report into me. I manage two lines of business. Uh, and it is completely opposite of my art career by night. I often say that I'm a corporate hussy by day and an art vampire by night. And that's sort of how I live my life. Thanks, Kirk. Um, yes, I work here <laughs> in academic affairs. So, you know, say hi to me in the hallway. Definitely not related in the sense that day to day I'm making art, but I feel like I like to think of it as art adjacent because I love coming to school and like seeing the exhibitions that are up. So I find it very inspiring in that way. Thanks, April. Yeah, fortunately, yeah, it's really, I've, worked, I've been working part-time at Opus Art Supplies for five years now. I started working there um, before coming to Emily Carr. I'm gonna probably help some of you. I noticed some faces. Um, and yeah, I graduated and still working there. Um, I work part-time, like I use three days, so. Um, yeah, like I consider Opus as my second classroom. It's great. It's not the most financial, financially stable job, but it's great because it's very flexible over there. Like uh, Opus for me is my second classroom. It's a studio where I learned so much about materials. Um, unfortunately, that is something I wasn't taught over here, but I'm lucky enough to learn over there. Like you've got all the products in your face. Um, also the discount helped a lot um <laughs> to get 30 percent so that helped me I really spend um materials that are great like um good materials um and also like opus has been um, um a great place for me to just have conversations with it's like a place where different creative people meet together you've got like these 
leisure um, artists, established artists, emerging artists, and professional artists. Um, there I met, I met Gordon Smith. Um, I talked to Bob, oh no, Bob, not, not Bob Ross, sorry, Ross Van Hull. Ross Van Hull, like Bobby Burgers, um, David Copeland, and like these artists, he talked to, helped to, um, it's like problem solving, uh, problem solving, and just, yeah, um, constant inspiration from like these people. Um, yeah. yeah, the discount's very helpful with inflation right now. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you all have careers, which is wonderful because Vancouver is a very expensive city. So that is a reality for so many artists. And I just want to ask, how do you keep your practice alive while maintaining and balancing another job? And how do you ensure you have enough creative energy at the end of the day to maintain that art practice? Um, it's funny. I've... I've struggled with this probably my whole professional career is like, you know, if I'm excelling in one aspect of my life, then the other one is suffering. Um, so it's really about managing the time I have in a day, in a week, in a calendar year. Um, and I just had to be really realistic within in terms of how I structure it. So I have a day job, which I start at 6 a.m. and I finish at uh, 3 p.m. And then I give myself some time to sort of unwind, get out of that corporate mode. And then I go straight into my art practice and I treat it like my evening job. And I do about four to five hours of painting uh, right after work. And I do it from Monday to Friday and just like my corporate job as well. So that has provided me enough sort of structure to, to manage both parts of my life. Um, and there is some overlapping, like there is uh, things that I can leverage from my artistic practice in, in my day job and vice versa. There are things that I've learned and been able to leverage uh, from a corporate environment into my artistic practice. So there are some, some overlapping, which is nice, but yeah, I have to keep it very regimented and structured and treat them both as my careers and jobs. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, same, same in a sense. I like I keep a physical planner and I, I don't know, I, I've, I've struggled with organization, but I find a physical planner helps me because I lay my week out. And I do actually find that the structure of having a day job also helps me because it divides the day. And I do a similar thing where evenings and like weekend mornings are for working on illustration. Like that's just how it is. Um, and I feel like I also combine that with like someone wants to hang out. It's like, okay, well, let's make it a drawing date. <laughs> like, I don't know, like let's maximize the time. I think that something that I've struggled with at different points has been days where I've just been like burnt out or tired and like feeling lazy, but then realizing that that is also just as important, I think, for like rejuvenating myself and like rest is also productive um in my opinion so yeah April. um yes like again time management um while i was in like i was work, i went i was in school i was um, working three days so that's like mostly my third like first year to third year it's like working three days in school for three days so i only have one day to make like to do all of my assignments and like whenever i have classes i usually make like big works and multiples of them so it's like really managing my time um, what helped me was like, as, as I've mentioned earlier, putting things down. Now I've learned and made my own brain dump journals, kind of similar to like planner, but it's more, um, it's more un, unstructured. It's like very messy like sketches, um, tasks, um, and yeah, prioritizing, prioritizing things. Like um, when I was in school, um, I, I, I need to make sure that I spend mo most of my time in, um, Works that I find hard, like writing um, essays and stuff, and then yes, um, and whatever is like um, whatever is like on dues the soonest. Um, um, yes, and then for me to um, gener generate like still keep that creative energies, um, um, making like works that are not related to arts, um, just lazing around doing household chores or watching dramas, uh, movies, documentaries. Um, last year, when I was like doing all those projects with the Vancouver Mural Fest and all the things, um, my the fellowship in writings, I told myself that I'm gonna take a break, but then at that time, I just couldn't take a break. So I ended up making small works on the side, 
something that is not necessarily relevant to what I like what I'm doing, but that helped me still create that um, um, create that um, energy flowing. And I guess I, one thing I want to share as well is like out of coming out of school, um, it's I guess a part of the transitioning is kind of also creating your own deadlines and timelines. Um, and that for me is through those proposals and exhibitions that I'm always submitting to and that it's another excuse for me to keep on creating art, um, um, doing um, like using those avenues as a way to kind of try out different things and like keep on, keeping, um, keeping on developing myself and my art practice. I'm gonna throw you all a little bit of a curveball as, as artists with jobs outside of art. And I'd like you to have have your thoughts on the concept that you're not a real artist unless you're a full-time artist. I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like can I, we just say no? <laughs> yeah, I feel like it's just not realistic, especially in cities where it's really expensive. I also think a lot of the people who are doing it full-time have support financial or otherwise from from fan, like it's invisible, but it's there. And I think you're fooling yourself if like you need to have financial security in some way. And that's different for everybody, but I, I think it's just like, yeah, it's, it's a myth that gets perpetuated. So it's like worth talking about a little bit. And, you know, it's funny. I struggled with this perception for a really long time and I almost felt guilty that I really loved my corporate job. Um, because then I wasn't truly an artist. I wasn't, you know, struggling. I wasn't in it. I wasn't just doing art. And then I realized I'm allowed multiple interests. I'm allowed to be curious about multiple things and I'm allowed to be good at multiple things. So I've stopped feeling guilty about that. I like both my jobs and I'm never going to give one up. And I also, for me, I, I enjoy coming to work because I like seeing different people and like getting out of my headspace of like just me and my desk. Like I do find it, I find it really helpful and enjoyable to like be around others. <laughs> like, so yeah. I mean, it's a little bit tangent for me. It's defining, well, it's kind of accepting that I'm an artist while I'm in school. Like I don't consider myself as, as an artist. I always have the artist um, art student and like in my bios because I don't feel that I am an artist. Um, it took a while to accept that I am an artist and um, you don't, also don't need a degree to uh, declare yourself an artist. Um, you can just be an artist by your own definition and declaration. Um, and thank you. So what landed you in your career pathway as an artist or an illustrator? And did you always know that that's what you wanted to be? Or did you stumble upon it at an early stage in life? Um, I think I definitely stumbled upon it. Um, I was lucky enough to have some really strong female, female people in my life, whether it be my mother, my grandmother, or the people around me that were teaching me. Um, and it was always centered around creating things, whether that be art or you know, craft or sewing. Um, so we were always doing something creative. And then also my family's business was automotive painting. So if I wasn't hanging out with those strong female uh, people in my life, then I was at the shop painting cars. And that was also not necessarily considered, you know, like fine art, but it was, you know, mixing the paint and experimenting with paint and it was, you know, creating something. So I was always around that. And then, you know, after, after I graduated and went to Emily Carr, it still was sort of like, am I going to do this art thing? Am I going to be an artist? And then I took a break. And then I came back to it because ultimately it's so inherently linked to my identity and who I consider myself to be. Um, so yeah, I think it's just been inherent and then it comes and goes at times. Um, yeah, I, I always wanted to like write and illustrate books. So I've wanted to do that since I was a little kid. When I was in high school in grade 12, considering what to do, um, I told my art teacher, I don't remember what I said, but he was like, oh, you're not in, good enough to do that program. You should apply to Langara where they have a good like foundation program. So I went to Langara and I did the fine arts program. And then I transferred to my car because they had illustration, which was what I wanted to do. Um, so yeah, I've just, 
I've always wanted to do this. I, I think that there were like times when I would get a little bit distracted. Like I remember after I graduated, I did a lot of like logo and business card design for um, family and friends because I was just like, oh, I'm getting paid to draw. This must be what I want to do. But I was like, actually, this isn't, this isn't like focused enough and I don't like this. So yeah, I, I think a little bit of figuring out along the way, but I always wanted to do it. Thanks, April. Yeah, it's also something that I wanted to do, but I wasn't encouraged. Um, I tried applying for an art school back home, but I failed. And so I had to go on and to my second option, which is, which is architecture. So I finished first year in architecture, um, which um, my mom loved, um, but I didn't love. Um, well, I love all the drawing parts, not the math part. Um, I struggled with my math, so I had to repeat my math and then passed everything. Um, and then eventually had to move here the same, like the same month. So 2015, I moved over here. We, may, we migrated over here and um, I got downgraded. Um, so back in the Philippines, I'm in college. So when I got here, I'm, I got downgraded to grade 12. So for me, which is like, it's great um, because it's something that I already expected um, to happen. Um, I came from a different, different educational um, system. So I know it's something that's coming. So I took that um, as um, just a challenge and a part of the adjustment coming over here. Um, I went to grade 12, finished grade 12, where I did a bunch of arts and I was encouraged by, encouraged by my teachers, um, did a bunch of um, spring classes, volunteered for classes in art, did the summer art camp, and then had to work for my English um, proficiency um, requirement. And it took a year off. And then while working full time at Tim's at that time, I was like, studying by myself, um, ended up do, making a test for the, doing tests for the English, and then eventually, um, um, eventually, um, reg I guess, um, registering over here. I also tried going to Langara, but I didn't pass their English test. So I did my IELTS test, um, got the IELTS result, um, registered over here and got it on my first try. Um, and yeah, like migrating over here kind of, Get, just allowed me to restart from the very beginning. Um, I was providing for myself. I was paying for my tuition. I was giving, um, sharing like household f finances as well. And the thing that allowed me to just like do what I want because I'm paying for myself, providing for myself. And yeah, now I'm doing what I want. Um, and now I'm figuring what I want to do next. That's yeah. perfect. Thank you, Carl. Um, we're down to our last question. What has helped you get to where you are in your practice? And what advice would you have for others who want to set off into a similar direction? Probably consistency for me is what has been the most sort of successful in my artistic practice is like being consistent, showing up, doing the work and continuing to do the work. Um, it was probably the thing I, I wasn't as great at uh, when I first left Emily Carr, and it was something I needed to learn. And um, that would be the also the advice that I give is like, show up, do your work, make the art, and eventually the opportunities will come. It's inherent if you're, if you're putting the time and effort into it, it will happen. Um, and also be okay with rejection. I get rejected all the time, and you need to have thick skin and let it go and then keep applying. Thanks, Kirk. Yeah, <laughs> I do feel like um, sometimes getting rejected, it's like, okay, I might as well like burn in hell because my art is trash, <laughs> but, but it's not true. Um, I think something that is important for me is like maintaining friendships with people I love who are also artists. Like, I think if the people around you are inspiring, it makes you want to go back and to the, draw to the drawing board. For me, that's like the most important thing is like having people around me who are also like illustrators and like actively working and like share the same dreams, even if they're not the same dreams. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, for me, it's like working hard and persevering in what you're doing right now. As an artist student, you're always asked why and what what you are making. Um, and for me, it's okay not to know what you're doing and what you know what um, what you're trying to do. Um, You've got all your time to figure out what you are trying to do. Um, you've got your pretty much like timeline. Some pe some people like know what they are doing at the very beginning, and some people takes their lifetime to figure that out, and that's okay. 
I was like watching a video about Kara Walker and she also kind of um, become famous at a very early stage, but she, um, at the time, she also don't know what she was doing. And so she was just accepting opportunities at that time and then learning as she was doing all those ex um, experiences. And yeah, like rejections, like rejections is part of the process of becoming an artist. Um, you'll like, you'll always hear and be prepared. Um, yeah, it's part of the process. And just like, yeah, like if you get rejections, just like move on. Um, it's because it's probably because it, does doesn't fit into the what they're looking for or what the call is it doesn't mean that your work is bad or it's a, uh, it's a trash it's just finding that right opportunity that would really um fit into what your um your pro your, your concept or what you're thinking or what you wanted to say amazing thank you we're going to open the floor for questions if you have questions for the panelists just raise your hand and i'll come over with a mic I'm not interested to know how do you feel about not having a career with your art practice like I know we talked about you having your job on the side and have, like earning a living but do you find a sense of frustration not being able to live from your art or your art practice I mean I feel like I do make money from the work that I make <laughs> Um, but I guess in terms of not living off of it, sometimes, sometimes I definitely feel a bit frustrated where I'm just like, man, wouldn't it be nice if I was rich, but I like, what can you do? <laughs> like, I do feel frustrated sometimes because I do just want more time to make art. Um, but, but yeah, I don't know. It kind of is what it is. I feel, I feel also, like I said, like, I do like going to a place where there are people. <laughs> so, Yeah. Uh, so I, I realized early on the work that I wanted to create wasn't necessarily the most commercial or um, the work that people would necessarily want to buy. So I actually used my alternative career or my other career as a way to, you know, sustain my lifestyle and provide for myself and not have to compromise or sacrifice the subject matter I wanted to paint or the paintings I wanted to create. So in actuality, it works out really nicely for me because I don't have to paint things I don't want to. Right now, um, no. Um, I'm, I know that I'm not, that I will not be able to financially like provide for myself at this early stage with, with my artwork. My focus is like trying to continuously do what I do. Um, like I have my part-time job to keep some money coming in, but like my priority right now is like really developing myself and being able to continuously do my art. Um, I know that I still want to study, go back to school and um, um, act, have more, um, expand my skills and have different skills. Um, I know that is the next goals and, and also kind of guess just teach myself on how to write grants, fund, um, fund for myself and for my projects while kind of having this part time. Thank you. Any other questions? It's for the people on Zoom so they can hear the questions. Yes, hello. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, can you suggest for newcomer like uh, places or maybe meetups to be like in this art community to uh, create new connections and socialize like in the art community? I'm not great in socializing, but uh, yeah. Uh, but for me, like I guess I'll just like share where I find opportunities, and because I that's where I find like that's how I do stuff. Um, I guess um, going. I mean, for like for socializing, showing up to exhibition like openings. Um, I think that's for sure one. Um, with talking with your friends and just like um, like events in school. Um, just yeah like networking with your friends first like going to galleries but finding opportunities opportunities for myself is online like i always search for um, art calls online 
um, always look at, um, I always search at the BC Alliance um, Culture. Um, it's an organization that have um, that has um, job postings, volunteer opportunities, um, and art calls. Um, another thing is um, I'm also, uh, I'm part of the, I'm a member of the Federation of Canadian Artists, which is at Granville Island. And that is um, another organization that have monthly calls. And so um, another, that's one way, that's another way for me to populate my CV while I'm in school. So it's, you've got like this thematic calls that, which you can apply for, they also require a membership fee, but yeah, I mean, that's part, like part of like, I guess my, my, process, my process of starting out like this exhibition is like spending for those calls. There's, there's also calls that are free and like calls that will also pay you, but that came like at the later part of my, like later part of my, um, my journey, like what I'm doing right now, like I do get commissions now that I'm paid, um, you're paid for the production of your artwork as well. But I started off paying like exhibitions just have like those names. Um, another um, way to populate your CV as a student is joining the art uh, art sales over here and organizing shows like and using activating the uh, like the available galleries in here. Um, and yeah, that's like part of becoming a student, just like making your own opportunities in what you have in here right now. And those are those open spaces over here. Um, those calls um, and just like going around to galleries and showing up. Like the one that I joined while I was in school, like I'm still part of it right now. It's the Federation of Canadian Artists, Artists at Granville Island. So um, they have different tiers of membership. So right now I'm still at the active membership, um, which you're kind of, you're, you to get into the gallery, you have to um, propose, uh, not to propose, but then you just have to submit your stuff and then you would get accepted or rejected. But yeah, I don't know how they reject, but I got in. So um, most of the calls, um, they ask you not to create, um, create I guess, or submit things that are done in school, which is a little bit odd. And so like, you just need to make works on the side or prepare for the submission calls, which is kind of thematic. I, I think also um, for me in terms of getting involved with community, um, Instagram was really important for me with just connecting with people after I graduated. Um, and I think if you have time, like volunteering at like Vancouver Mural Festival, for example, I, I, I don't know, I did that a couple of years and it, it's just really fun. And like you get to know so many people. Um, yeah. Honestly, all of those points uh, that I would sort of, you know, touch on, but also the people around you right now. This, I, I graduated 15 years ago or so, um, and my art community or the people I met at Emily Carr, they're, you know, we go, our lives look very different. Some of them have kids, they're married, they're buying homes, um, but we meet up at least once a week or every other week and we go for walks and we talk about art and we connect. And honestly, that's been the community that sort of kept me going. And then, you know, going to the art shows and exhibitions and openings, that's really where you're going to meet the Vancouver art scene, as, as I call it. Um, and I wish I was better at that. It's something that I need to continue to do, but um, everyone's really nice too. Artists are great. You're going to meet them. You're going to like be like, why didn't I just do this from the very beginning? So that's the advice I'd give. I'll just add that if you're not already subscribed to Instant Coffee, it lists like all of the openings that are happening in Vancouver. And it also sends you like calls for submissions and open calls for residencies and everything like that. So if you're new to Vancouver or just like aren't subscribed already, instantcoffee.org. Instant. Uh, instantcoffee.org. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're like an email list, like a listserv, and they list like all of the gallery openings. People submit everything to that. Like it's a very common practice in the art world. So they have one for multiple cities, but subscribing to the Vancouver one is like top notch, especially if you're looking for gallery openings to go to, because the more gallery openings you go to, the more you see the same faces and the more you see the same faces, you start making connections. Um, following organizations as well, following galleries, um, yeah, different organizations. Um, that's 
oh, yeah, it, on Instagram, that's sometimes where I find opportunities as well, like local ones. I'm um, just like keep on following them. And sometimes, well, they do have um, calls. So it's like another another way. It's like Instagram. Any other questions? Um, yeah, a question I have is, do you have a, any like tips for students that are in their last years or looking back? Is there like something you wish you would have done in your last year of art school? Uh, I'll start. Um, me? Well, part of like part of me, like well, I thought, I guess, well, if I would, um, I guess, well, how would I start it? <laughs> um, it's, I guess, it's trying different mediums, um, um, but, which I was, like, encouraged. Like, I had to take, like, breadth requirements because I was, like, during, in school, I was, like, taking just painting. And so I had to take, like, in, like, other, other um, courses, which I had to take book, bookmaking. And I had like another interdisciplinary um, painting, which was a screen printing and painting um, on my bookmaking. And it's still up making paintings, make turning my paintings into book. But well, yeah, just expanding, like trying different mediums, which cannot be true as well, because in my case, being able to just stick to like my painting, being able to have a concrete body of work helped me, I believe, get into what I do now. And I was able to do what I wanted to do during the end of the year throughout all of those um, throughout of those um, projects that I had to do. But yeah, like I guess try to make most out of the resources in school, like the facilities, facilities, your profs always, I mean, ask them, ask questions, um, create a connection with them, relationship, like good relationship, because um, I guess Towards my third year, everything is online. And so it's hard to create connections. I only got back to school during my last term in fourth year. Um, and so that was the only time where I was able to talk to um, my profs, um, which are lovely. I had Vanessa and Christine, which I hoped I had more time working with them because they're amazing people. And so, yeah, like making most of what you have in here and then just preparing yourself out there. Like try to think, like try to picture yourself what you wanted to do. It's okay not to do, but it's great to have something that would direct you or that would help you um, steer to something, to, to that next goal. Um, it's possible that you might not be able to achieve what that, that is, but it would, for, for in my case, it helped me get to where I am right now. It's like, I was able to, yeah, like I was able to imagine ambitious projects, able to do it, like work on it, propose, um, propose the things and now it's kind of like yeah practice like you just propose get rejected accepted do your work um, and just do more things I think for me I I feel like I look back and I wish I'd been less shy I think just to make friends with people I I don't know when I look back I'm like oh I should have just been a little more fearless in terms of connecting with the people that were around me in my year um, I think that came for me a little bit like right as we graduated and after. So I think I wish I'd done that more when I was in school. Um, and I think also not being my own obstacle. I think as you get older, you realize, okay, the people who win things win because they applied. And I think when I look back, I'm like, oh, I didn't apply to this bursary because I just assumed I wouldn't get it. Like, but just don't assume that you won't get something. Um, or that you won't get into something or that you won't be accepted. Like prepare yourself for rejection, but also don't like assume that you're gonna be rejected. Um, yeah. I was like, I was I, I was glad you guys went first. I was like, <laughs> I don't remember. Uh, but um, I think looking back on it, I wish I painted what I wanted for my final sort of thesis. Uh, I think I got really concentrated on all of the, you know, feedback from my professors and peers. And it it got to a point where I was creating work that really wasn't what I was interested in and um, wasn't work that uh, I would continue on with. Um, there was aspects of it that I still uh, sort of take away and, and use today, but the subject matter 
culture is very different. So I wish I would stayed a little bit more authentic to what I wanted to do and what brought me joy. Um, and then also, yeah, everything that you guys both said, like, don't be afraid of rejection, apply for things and also build an art community. Do it like you have you're surrounded by really talented, amazing people and they're your peers. Don't lose track of them. Like make those connections now because I wish I did that because I don't have nearly enough art friends. So I'm kind of jealous of you guys. I wish I was still here building those connections. <laughs> yeah, I just want to add up um, on to the um, applying. Like, just do it. It's better to do it than not to do it because first, even if you get rejected, you have your proposal with you. You have your ideas contextualized. And so you will always have that piece of information which you can always rework on. Um, it might not, um, and which is something you could also like retweak. We can always go back into those proposal, retweak it so that it would fit into the next proposal that you have in mind. Um, and so that's another thing that I also realized is just like putting all your like all your ideas down, um, whatever it is, like words, just ideas, like sketches. Have it on a piece of paper, a sketchbook, because you can always go back into those ideas whenever that perfect or ideal um, call comes in. Great. I have a long question from the online attendees. Um, how do you get your work out there? Slash, how did interested commissioners find you? How much work did you have out there until you started getting commissions or clients, um, sales, et cetera? Uh, how long did it take you until people started commissioning you? or contacting you versus you pitching or applying for things. And I can repeat any part of this at any time. Um, I, I've, I've asked different people who've approached me how they found me. I People have found me through Instagram. A lot of people have found me through Instagram. I also, there's a website called Women Who Draw and I uploaded, it's basically a directory of like, women artists so I people have found me through there um and then also just like connections in terms of friends um I'm wait can you repeat the rest of your um so how long did it take you until people started contacting you versus your pitching or applying to things so like I know that you've been like contacted for like Carl's been contacted to do commissions and like you've been chosen to do mural festival like at what point did it was it like having your work out there versus you pitching and applying for things like reputation versus i think for me personally it's still a little bit a matter of like pushing and like putting my work out there like, i think you can't stop doing that unless you're really famous i guess um but maybe it took i think it definitely took a few years for sure like and in terms of the first children's book that I illustrated, that came from me doing like a postcard mail out. So I did that in 2017 and I sent out like 80 postcards to different publishers. Um, and then I got one publisher that was like, okay, illustrate this children's book. So that came from that. And that was like three years after I had graduated. It's a little fuzzy to think about how long. What about like the magazines, like thinking about the Globe and Mail and Chatelaine? Um, Chatelaine, Chatelaine I just did last year. I worked with them last year. Vancouver Foundation was last year. Globe and Mail was 2020. So maybe that was, that took like six years until I started working with Globe and Mail. I still work with them very regularly. Um, I'm trying to think of before that. Before that, probably I was doing a lot of like applying to like Capilano Courier and like, I think Briar Patch contacted me in 2019. Yeah. My agent, uh, my agent is just for books. So I was pitching to agents for seven, from like May until the end of November um, last year. And I pitched to 20 different agents. So that's just for books and editorial stuff is all um, separate from that. Yeah. Okay. Um... For me, like, I think at least a year, um, I, as I mentioned, I um, started submitting at the Federation and the Granville Island um, in like second year. Um, and then I got my first um, accepted work over there at 2019. 
um, and then kept on submitting um, to their calls. And that's how I got yeah my CV populated. Um, and then kept on submitting things and submitting things which I had another call at a different different place at the, the Seymour Art Gallery. And then, um, like, yeah, I guess, yeah, just kept on submitting things. And then during my third year when I did that online transition, I was able to, yeah, apply a bunch. So that was like summer, fall. And the calls were, um, I guess, for the next year. And then just, which was like winter. And I did my um, Richmond art. No, it's, it's not Richmond. It's this uh, the Rich Gallery Museum, and then continued other ones. Like, yeah, it's like my commissions. I never kind of um have uh, a vocal um advertisement of my commissions. My first commission was through a tag that I did, um, which was an Emily Carr tag. Um, so a collector um or someone. Um, contacted me through Instagram because on those tags, the I believe it's like the ECU, I see you, Emily Carr artist. Like he found me through those tags and asked me if I could make something for him. And so that's one of the commissions. And most of my commissions are now these gallery ones where I propose. Um, fortunately, I get into these proposals, which will take some time because, due, due to the process. But yeah, I did. At least spend a year on trying to get in to the Federation of Canadian Artists. So I, when I graduated Emily Carr, like Instagram wasn't really a place you like showed your artwork. It was more like in like friendship connecting and things like that. So when the shift of social media became something that you could leverage to get opportunities, I noticed right away that's where a lot of them were coming. So I think, you know, when it comes to commissions, typically they come from my social media or, you know, my website. I'm very protective of commissions, though, or I guess reserved to doing them. Um, I find with commission work, people tend to commission you to execute their ideas and not the other way around. Um, so I only take on commissions where I have full artistic freedom and they're investing in my work and my body of work and not um, I'm not an instrument just to execute their ideas. So um, I'm very selective in my commissions, but I do have a backlog that I need to complete. Uh, I typically do about five commissions a year and they're already scheduled, uh, you know, before the year starts. I have, I think six I have to do this year. <laughs> and I say have to because I don't enjoy commissions as much as I should probably. Um, and then opportunities. Um, often I'll apply for opportunities that interests me and that sort of align with my artistic practice and then other opportunities tend to come from that so i applied for an online exhibition during covid uh that was part of uh the uh, visionary sort of uh, instagram and online world and then they contacted me directly to be part of their first publication visionary magazine so often you know opportunities will come from the opportunities that I sought out. So keep that in mind. Um, though you might apply uh, once, those opportunities continue to sort of roll into one another. Um, the Vancouver Mural Fest, I applied, I think, twice. And I think I was having one of those poor me moments where I was like, I'm not <laughs> applying to this anymore. It's not a thing. And then they contacted me randomly and said, we've had your work on file for several years now, and we have someone who's really excited to, to work with you. So even when you get rejected, it doesn't necessarily mean that opportunity won't come your way. And that was like an aha moment for me where I was like, oh, like that was worth my time. I, it was worth my time applying more than once and still like getting rejected. It eventually came around. So keep that in mind as well, just because it's a no now doesn't mean it's a no forever. And like with the applying as well, even if you get rejected, like they will remember your name at least like that's another um pros of submitting is that like you're putting your name out there um and people yeah will get back to you um and another thing i wanted to share is scams instagram scams there's so many out there um red flag of commission is that they will um identify themselves first like i'm this person i work for this and then can i commission you 
but there's so much scams um, um, on Instagram. Like I always receive one and like, yeah, just report it, block it. But like it would, yeah, I think for me, like if they um, introduce themselves first, and that would be a red flag and then create the conversation and but still be careful with commissions for like for the, watch out for those scams thank you there's a couple more questions from online uh one is instagram or tiktok which one do you find better for exposure and return on investment i'll be able to answer this really quickly um i don't have tiktok not part of my generation so i only use instagram <laughs> Um, I have both, but I I use TikTok just for fun. Like I make little video diaries um, and I find that very like fulfilling in a different way where I'm just like making little, I don't know. It's not illustration, but I find it very fun. Um, so I don't really put any of my illustration work on there. Yeah, I might, maybe. Like I don't, I don't make money yet <laughs> out of my uh, Instagram, but um, Instagram was my first website. Um, and so I had like this personal account, which I turned into an art account. And that's how I get my things out there. Um, it takes a while to kind of get the validation that it's okay to show your work and that's okay. And I, yeah, that's part of like um, the process of just like show, like showing what you do, like the consistency as well, like practicing yourself of just like sharing what you have. Um, and I think being messy and unstructured is another way for your followers to see who you are as a person. Um, it's the best way to connect to them in a more um, personal way, like commenting and just like sharing what you do. Um, I started with my Instagram that is very just like my artwork, but now it has become all the things that I do. Um, and that's the, where I spend most of my time. I have TikTok, but it's just kind of creating videos to post on my Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> I do think um, also thinking about Instagram, not just as like, like I think thinking of it as a place to interact with people and not just to like collect followers, but like actually thinking of it as like an engaged space, um, even with the algorithm or whatever, I, f I feel like it's, it's helpful to think of it in that way. It's funny. Uh, I actually hadn't met Carl until tonight and we've followed each other on Instagram forever. So it was just like, I feel like I know you, but I really don't. So like, yeah, Instagram's great to connect with the community. I, I feel like I know a lot of people that I've never actually met, strangely. Okay, there's another question here. Are there online art communities if you've lost touch with your fellow art students? This is, I guess, for April and Kirk, who have been out of school a little bit longer. Um, seems very awkward to just show up to other people's openings and make friends. I'm hopelessly shy. <laughs> That's actually how I met Sara. <laughs> I literally showed up at her uh, uh, opening and I introduced myself and we became friends. So I know it's hard and it's uncomfortable because I'm painfully shy at sometimes as well. But trust me, it's worth it. Do it. You'll meet a lot of great people. Um, but I started off online first. That's where I started connecting with people and building that rapport. And I was able to be like, oh, I, I know your work. I follow you. And it's just a nice sort of icebreaker. So start online and then go to the openings. Yeah, I agree. The same. And I feel like it also depends on maybe like your specific art community, like in terms of comics, for example, I think Cloudscape Comics creates, um, like they have community events where you can go to workshops and like interact. So maybe look for the specific thing that you're trying to do, because I'm sure it's different for like painting or like fine art, but. Yes, I'm also not great in like going to exhibitions or talking to people during my exhibition, but be, uh, be open <laughs> on like those conversations. Um, I went to this artist a curatorial talk for our um, Vancouver Mural Fest. So our curator had a talk and through that talk, um, I was approached by other people and now I'm working, collaborating with um, a filmmaker right now. Um, I can't tell what the project is yet, but it's like I'm working with another project and yeah, it was that person who approached me first. And then, yeah, it's like same as Kirk, like yeah, connecting, like using Instagram to connect to other people, which you might not necessarily meet all the time, but it's like always the surprise. Whenever I go out there, people would introduce themselves first to me that I'm this person. I follow you on Instagram. And that's why I try to do now too, like to just um, 
um, acknowledge like people that I follow and work, which kind of creates more genuine connection. Also, maybe like while you're still at this beginning stage, make sure your Instagram handle is something you like. <laughs> So many people will be like, hey, Apricot, because my Instagram is Apricot Joy and not my actual name. Um, but, you know, just a side note, make sure it's not like, I don't know, broken hot dog or something. Like, make sure you're searchable on Instagram. Yeah. It's yeah, usually yeah. helpful. <laughs> um, are there any more questions in the room before I answer another online one? <laughs> Um, thank you for the information in this talk. Um, I find it very helpful. Um, uh, my question is, um, what is the best way to approach creating a proposal? Because we talk about rejection and like keep going and I'm wondering like what's the best way to like create a proposal that will stand out? Um, yeah. In, uh, yeah, for me, in case of proposal, uh, my first proposal was assignment. So it's like through Emily Carr. And so um, I kind of, well, before writing that, I had to search on how to make one. Um, but it's always great to have one because you can always tweak it. But when proposing, for me, like, um, it's like you should be able, well, one thing is um, addressing the place. Um, where like, why are you showing or why do you want to show into this place? Like address your proposal, like um, through the, the space first, also the um, the theme, the concept, um, those for sure. And sometimes they also ask you to create, um, I guess, to have an image with your proposal and not just like your artwork, but an image that also kind of works around the space. So you don't have to have the best um, rendered um, image or like um, image for your proposal, it's okay to have like sketches of it as long as you are um, directing your proposal into space, talking about your proposal in the space and why you connect to this space. Um, that's one thing like I, yeah, I like, I don't know why I get in actually, I never ask, sometimes they <laughs> tell me, but great that I get in. I guess I'm like hitting those um, those uh, those marks that they're looking for. And yeah, always, if you can try to ask feedback, ask feedback. Most of the calls, they never give you feedback. Um, so try to ask if you can. Uh, honestly, I would say the same thing is just make sure that you're like, uh, doing your research on where you're proposing, like often if it's a generic proposal just because you want to show your artwork somewhere and it's not catered to the, the place you're applying, it's like an immediate no. And also know like what kind of work that they show and that they're interested in because if it doesn't align with yours, they're probably not going to select you. So yeah, do your homework before sort of going into it. Um, that's always where I found my most success, where it seems to align with the, the gallery's sort of vision of what they want to show. I don't know if I, I don't do a lot of like art, like I have done a couple for murals, but I guess in terms of applying it to pitching, it's much the same. Like I feel like I looked for agents that wanted work that I wanted to make. Um, so yeah, making sure it's catered and then you're not like, it's about community and you're like, this artwork is not at all about that. So making sure they can marry, but. Perfect, so there's this question online and it says, what has helped you to be able to structure your business as an artist, AKA pricing for works, murals, etc." Heavy loaded question for all of you. Um, well, there's a book, oh my God, what is it called? Graphic Artist Design Guild. It's a, it's a guide for pricing your work, which is really helpful. Um, I'm probably butchering the name, but I do have the most recent copy at home. Um, but yeah, I think that that's helpful in terms of a jumping off point for pricing your artwork, which uh, a lot of places don't pay you what you <laughs> deserve, uh, frankly. Some, some do, which is great, but it's good for knowing like, okay, I'm not like crazy for charging this. 
also looking up Carfax. Um, Carfax, um, it's, um, how would you call them? It's like very, well, uh, an established um, organization that helps artists, um, yeah, find rates that would fit into their the projects. They have various rates for like different artists, um, different exhibitions, different um, opportunities. So it's great to, um, I think they also have membership, which you, there's different, um, different benefits as well. Um, so which also helps you kind of just establish you like your um, kind of rights to their rates, but it's um, available for all, um, yeah, artists, so yeah. I've taken a bit of a strange approach to this, which I don't necessarily recommend, but I'll share sort of how I price my work. So I usually sought out my richest friend <laughs> who has money to buy artwork. And I often ask them, what would you buy? What, what price would you buy this artwork? And they'll give me their honest opinion. And if I want to sell it, it's usually around that price. And if I don't, I jack it up. And if I really want to get rid of something, I'll jack it down. So I know that's not like a perfect solution, <laughs> but it's strangely worked for me. <laughs> You can actually work that backwards. So there's a couple of different pricing formulas for the people who work two-dimensionally. One is united inch and the other one is square inch. If you work in a really large variety of sizes, I recommend looking up united inch because that adds the two, whereas square inch times is the two, multiplies the two. So it keeps your prices more aligned if you work in a large size range, whereas if you work in a really small size range, like you only work in 20 by 20 and 24 by 24, square inch is fine. But if you're working anywhere from like 12 by 12 to like 48 by 48, you might want to consider United Inch. So there's not this massive difference in pricing. Uh, you can look both of those up online. There's also a really fantastic book in the library here called Art Slash Work. It's a bright orange book. You can't miss it. Take it out. It's got like a whole amazing section on pricing. <laughs> but also doing your market research, like find someone or like an artist that you follow or yeah, or someone that kind of fits on your level and look how they price their work. And you can base it off from that. You can add more into it or less depending on how you feel, but doing your market research is another kind of substantial way on how to see um, like the prices out there and how would you kind of how would you see being compared to like those people? We have time for one more question before we let the panelists socialize among you. So do we have any more questions before? <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you for the great answers and information. Like, I have a question about artificial intelligence and what do you think about it in the future? And maybe you already use it in your work to create some sketches. Do you afraid of it that it will like steal your work? Yeah. So. <laughs> um, I have I have feelings. I I think it makes me. I think in one sense it's exciting what computers can do, but I do think it makes me angry because I think a lot of the training has been done without consent from the artists. I'm, I'm pretty sure there's like a, a very big lawsuit happening right now. Um, but yeah, I, I don't use AI for my artwork. I think like maybe down the road if people, like I can see people like training for themselves, like if it's just themselves, like, I don't know, I, I guess I can see it being used, but I, I would only be comfortable if it was used by the artist for themselves, not like, I don't know. Yeah, it's some, it is something that I that makes me feel a little bit emotional, actually. I, it makes me a little bit mad. <laughs> So I actually have been sort of indifferent about it, to be quite honest, because my work is so much different in person than online. Um, I, my work is really based around the materiality of paint. Um, so uh, unfortunately, artificial intelligence really can't mimic that. Um, so when it comes to my work, I'm not really too worried. But I do think it's an interesting conversation and topic for right now for artists that you know, it, it can impact. Um, but for me personally, I don't necessarily have a stance yet. I'm not emotional about it yet, but I could get there. 
Like for me, it would be the consent and copyright. And that's an artist, like as an artist, that's something that you would, that you should protect off like your own copyrights um, for your own work. And yeah, and I guess if it's, well, I'm also not sure how much, but for me, that would be the case, like just about your copyrights. Um, there are ways on how to, um, I guess, like create your copyrights. It's easy for books and stuff or writing, I think as well, but yeah, um, I guess as an artist, it's always just great to just have your own um, contracts as well, agreements. Um, and yeah, like signing it, like putting into the agreement that the artist's work is wholly yours. Um, most agreements that I get from galleries, um, I'm able to retain, like part of the contract is that I'm able to fully retain my own um, copyrights. So that's another great um, thing, or that's another thing to watch out for your copyright and consent. Amazing. Thank you, everyone. Can we give the panelists a round of applause? I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. And we're always looking for more topic suggestions. So if there's something you really want to learn from a group of alumni, please fill out our survey. It's just five questions. And there's an area to leave comments about what you'd like to learn. Because what we want to do is make sure that students like you are able to learn about the topics you want to learn. So thank you so much and feel free to chat with our panelists.